Jesus. Ah, oh, that makes it a little better for everyone. Well, it is a wonderful evening and I'm so glad. Um, we've got some time before it's really time to start, but wow, summer I think has arrived. I'm up in a ponytail and that kind of thing, so life is good, but um, we'll wait a little bit, let our friends come and join us because it is, it is good. Life is wonderful, so yeah. Thinking about vacation plans a little bit. Hey, you know, it, it is time to start thinking about that and how we're going to, Ron and I are going to try and get a few things done while we're um, having maybe a week off or so. I think we're going to head to Florida to see a grandson. That's going to be really fun. So um, that's going to be great. And then back to, you know, work and fun and games. And so, yeah, yeah. I pray that uh, each of you have had a week that is um, good, that God has been gracious. Um, it, it, it again, I, it has not failed to amaze me what we are being uh, confronted with. It seems like every day there's something new for us to um, have to think about and have to deal with. Uh, this week has obviously been uh, no different, and we've had some horrible things happen in our society and maybe some breakdown that we need to think about how do we as brothers and sisters in Christ start to wrap our hands and our arms around our neighbor and those who are uh, different from us and and be with them. For those of you who uh, were, on, were listening on Sunday to our live, it was a little grainy because we realized we lost our Wi-Fi at the church, but we found out it was a router problem and, um, and also a megahertz problem. This is part of that technology stuff that I'm learning about. And uh, we have a new router and now we have our megahertz increased. So it shouldn't cause us any problems now. Uh, we should be in good shape uh, to move forward. In fact, when uh, they came to change it out, they couldn't believe we had been doing anything with what we had uh, before. So how they were like, how have you been streaming anything? And I, well, we just have been. So from the house, it was never that way. But apparently from the church, or from the church we just didn't have all the megahertz we needed. So uh, things have gotten taken care of. So hopefully we'll be not quite so grainy in the weeks ahead uh, anyway. But so I pray that you have all, uh, it warmed up today. I mean, I think summer did arrive all of a sudden. Uh, it seemed like that there for a while we weren't going to get any summer and boom, now it's here. But I guess that's how it's supposed to be. And uh, the bugs are the bugs are out and the Oh, the flowers are blooming and the crops are coming up and uh, God is good. God is good and continues to bless each of us in our in our lives together. So, um, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I have been kind of just reviewing what we've talked about and in these three weeks before and we talked about who and fear and what are kind of the key words I took out of each of those lessons and we're going to talk about peace be with you today which is God has a plan you know what do we fear what is it that um we fear so much what are you concerned about um who is it that you're looking for? All of those 
pieces. And so, so tonight to be talking about peace. Peace be with you and with each of us in our uh, locations. Um, I'm saddened when I listen to the news and hear about what has been going on and the the things that have been destroyed, lives that have been ripped apart. It, it is such a um, heart-wrenching to know that we are in a time of, I don't even know how, what you call it. We're just in such a, it seems like such a destructive time in our world that we tear apart instead of build up. And so as I was thinking about our lessons we have been through with who are we looking for and what do you fear? What are you concerned about? What? Don't be afraid afraid we don't need to be afraid and then tonight we'll we'll go with peace be with you peace with each of us that as we go about our days and our time that we have peace in our lives and in our journeys and so how do we find that when it feels like the tension is just pulling us apart? How do we find peace in our midst? And I hope tonight that we can kind of come to that point of discovering that. I've even been thinking about, we only have this month's worth of lessons is going to take us through our seven next words of Christ. And uh, I think next, starting in July, I think we're going to go back to the beginning I think it'd be good. I think we're going to start with Genesis 1, and we're just going to walk through Genesis. We're going to remember the story. We're going to remember our roots that we came from. And maybe, def def excuse me, discover some commonalities of our roots and our Jewish roots and even our Muslim roots. Because... All three roots come from the beginning. And so we need to talk about that. So that's going to, I think, going to be our next. I think it's going to be kind of fun. I'm kind of excited about, about that, um, that we'll be able to start in July looking at Genesis. It'll be good. So um, I think we're going to, let's just stop where we are and let's pray for a moment. Lord, move, af move afresh in the midst of your church today. Come in. Your peace is needed. Remove all doubt. Open our minds so that we may understand the scriptures. And fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit so that we may be witnesses of your resurrection, preachers of repentance and messengers of forgiveness. We know, God, that you are with us in a time such as this that the world it seems so broken and it seems so difficult. God, we know you're with us. Continue to hold us and wrap us that we may know your peace, your peace in all that we do. Be with us this night and in the nights ahead. Let us feel your presence. In your name we pray. Amen. I'm going to start with a little bit of a story, I think, to tell you. In fact, I'm going to read this one because this was just pretty good. And I, I don't think I can share anything that's any better. In January 1999, 
Kerry drove his car onto a railroad crossing and placed the gear in park. He had seen the caution lights start to blink moments earlier, but almost welcoming the danger made his way into the path of the locomotive. For the next few moments, he sat patiently, waiting to die. Many wonder what would cause a young man in his mid-twenties to be to do something so reckless. What most do you what most do not know is that Carrie's life had become unbearable. With one disappointment after another, the strain and stress grew unmanageable. Friends described Carrie as a normal young man who seemed a bit down and sometimes despondent about his circumstances. Hesitant to reach out to his friends or family for help, he struggled to find peace within the heavy web of depression. Some saw glimpses of his decline, but no one could have imagined this. As the train approached, the brakes began to squeal. The engineer blew the horn frantically. What could possibly be wrong with this fellow? Exasperated, he yelled, why won't he move? It appeared nothing could have stopped the unfolding tragedy. Suddenly, almost miraculously, the car lurched forward, pressing the accelerator. The driver peeled out from between the crossing guards. Moments later, the train passed without damage, except perhaps to the engineer's emotional condition. The police arrested the driver and charged him with reckless endangerment. When asked why he drove his car onto the crossing, he said he intended to commit suicide. However, moments before the train was to plow into his car, he claimed the voice of God said, Your life is not over. Don't finish it this way. The man was convicted and later admitted to a local treatment facility for depression. Hmm. God spoke? God spoke? I think he does. In fact, I know he does. I'll tell you my own story in a little bit. But there's another story here to contrast that incident with a story about little Emily and an amazing spring day filled with all the joy and expectations that new seasons bring. Emily's father, Ronnie, who enjoyed spending his free time working in the yard and doing odd jobs around the house, was a successful physician in a moderate-sized southern town. The father of three, Ronnie part particularly enjoyed outside activities while in the company of his children. Their family was more than tight-knit. They did life together. Often neighbors saw the entire family side by side engaged in some lazy day activity. One thing that most impressed onlookers was the deep spiritual nature exhibited by the children. From an early age, each child radiated a genuine love of God and spiritual connection. The entire family showed a sincere commitment to God and to one another, a true rarity in today's complicated world. And so on this particular spring day, three-year-old Emily turned a seemingly inconsequential moment into a holy experience. While tending to a patch of weeds growing in one of the flower gardens, Ronnie noticed Emily surveying a gardenia bush that had produced one simple bloom. After several minutes, Emily turned to her father and said, Daddy, I want to give that flower to God. And Ronnie replied, well, sweetheart, 
instead of picking it, why not just say that God can have it? That will be a great gift. Emily nodded in approval, and then in a very serious but sincere manner, turned around and faced the sky and closed her eyes. A hushed silence ensued. It went on and on. Finally, Ronnie was startled to hear Emily say, You're welcome. Ronnie knew that a holy moment had been born from the sincere and quite astute heart of a three-year-old whose ability to listen to the voice of God had not been overwhelmed by the noise of this world. Oh, how God must have enjoyed that conversation. Now, maybe there's three types of people in our world. Those who hear God in the squealing breaks. Those who hear God in flowers. And those who refuse to hear God at all. But the real hope for humanity is that God continues to beckon whether in the bright light of the day or the darkness of depression, God does not forget to call our names and bring us home. I love both of those stories. To me, they both speak about where God is and how he works through each of our lives. I would like for you to open your Bibles to Luke 24. Luke 24. Some of these verses we've already heard, but we're going to read them again. Luke 24, verse 35. Luke 24, verse 35. Then the two told what had happened on the way, and how Jesus had recognized, was recognized by them when he broke the bread. When he broke the bread at the table. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were still... And while they still did not believe, yet because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate in their presence. Now, I have to say something about Jesus. <laughs> Maybe it's a little ironic. Jesus wanted to eat. He wanted to eat wasn't so concerned with maybe what was going on there. A little questioning. Sometimes we think about doubting Thomas, who really wasn't a doubter. He was really a questioner and wanted to grow his faith. He wanted to grow deeper in his love of a God who he loved dearly. Hmm. Huh. So we've already we've already been on the road to Emmaus. You'd have thought the disciples would have figured this one out. I guess they're still not quite on track with what's going on. And Jesus just says, Peace be with you. And I can't imagine for them what they thought, because here's this living, living Jesus with bones and flesh, with the nail. Wounds are still there in his hands and his feet. But he 
he's standing there and he's just said, peace be with you. And then he just asks for some food. I have to tell you, God does speak. Sometimes I think it is the sound of the brakes and the squealing and it's loud. Sometimes it's very quiet, as little Emily found out, as she was having her moment with God. I've had several occasions that I know God spoke loudly to me. One of them was only about four years ago, five years ago, about four years ago. We were living in Omaha at the time. We had just moved back from Arizona. It would have been, we had just been back about 10 months. It would have been that first October after we came back. And I was driving home from church that night and I was struggling. I had uh, questions on my mind about, because um, I was helping at a church in Fremont, but I wasn't sure where God was leading me. I felt very lost for a moment, for a while. I had been teaching confirmation that night. It was in October and we were doing reformation. And I just read the story to the kids about Luther and where he had been thrown from the horse because of being in the lightning storm and how he questioned where God was and he heard God that night. I was driving home. I'd gotten on the highway and it was a harvest moon. Bright, big, beautiful moon. The clouds were phenomenal. I had to pull off the highway. And I just sat there and I'm like, God, I don't know what you're doing. What am I supposed to be doing? Oh no, God, I know what you're doing. You've got the plan. What am I supposed to be doing? Where am I being led to? I know you're guiding me. You're leading me. You're kind of kicking me. But to where? To what? I don't know where I'm headed. I felt alone, abandoned, maybe doubting, maybe doubting like Thomas, but more questioning because I knew God had the plan. I just didn't know it. I sat there for a long time just watching the moon and the clouds. God spoke. And it was very clear, it was peace be with you, my child. I have the plan. I want to write it on your forehead. I want you to know clearly that I have it in control. Just be patient and remember well, peace I give you. peace. Well, it wasn't too long, and I uh, later on called one of my friends at the church, and I said, you know, I didn't think I'd ever say this or do this, but where did you get your tattoos, your tattoo done? And she told me the name of the place, and I said, I need you to go with me. And she's like, why? And I said, because I need that says, okay, it's backwards for you all. It says peace. I said, I need peace so that I remember well this God has my plan. I don't. But peace to remind me when I am angry or frustrated, questioning or concerned that you have the plan. 
God continues to beckon and call each of us. He calls us. He calls us to sit at his feet. At the foot of the cross, he calls us and gives us the words, peace be with you. Does that sound like words we need to hear? It's the words I want to shout through the TV. Peace, folks. God's got this. Can we listen? Can we be patient? Can we be like Carrie, maybe? Or maybe we are. Or are we like Emily? Peace be with you. Jesus was alive for the disciples. He's alive for you and me. He's calling you and me. Even in these most desperate of times, he's calling us to hear his words. One of the adversaries Famous tactics is doubt. Doubt is what breaks us in our relationship from the God of creation who created us. Because doubt will give us low self-esteem, lack of direction, anger, paranoia. He will take us down the rabbit's hole to a place very far away. Turn to John 19, no, John 20, John 20, John 20. And again, we've seen these verses several times, but we're looking at them again, starting at verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together and the doors were locked for fear of the Jews, oh no, Jesus came and stood among them and said, I bet you can guess this, peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw him. And again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Do you hear it? Do you hear what's happening? And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. The giving of the Holy Spirit. We just had Pentecost Sunday. We just had the giving of of the Spirit to each of us as baptized children of God. You have received the Spirit of reconciliation, the Spirit of peace. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord! Sounds like what Luke wrote. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, for the third time now, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. 
Then Jesus told him, because you have seen, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I think it's interesting in John that we get the three times of peace be with you. You know, it's always significant when we get that number three in there, the Trinity. Totally amazing. John wanted to prove the point that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. He wants it clear that the giving of the Holy Spirit came to each of them. It is clear that Thomas is the one who isn't going to just accept things as status quo. He will want a little more information. I think he was just wary. Now I have to say, after that night and that October, that I feel like I was having my own God moment, my own Reformation time. It wasn't too long before I knew the decision that I had to make. I had to make the next step. God was just getting me ready. And I had to make a decision to put my name out and see where did I land? Where was God calling me to? And God called me to Axtell, Kansas. What a blessing. I left my doubts and my concerns that October night along the highway, looking at that moon. God spoke very clearly. In fact, God's voice sounded very much like my grandmother. Yeah, sure, you betcha. But I knew it was God. I knew God was present and he was preparing me. And I just had to humble myself to him, I had to, in essence, come to the foot of that cross and listen to what he wanted me to hear. I had to be open. Well, what God really wants is for you and me, with all of our failures and all of our fears, to reach out, to touch him. He has scars. Jesus already has all the scars for everything you and I have done. He already has them. You and I have to reach out. We have to reach out so that and maybe, maybe we do want to wonder why Jesus wanted the disciples to look at his hands and his feet. Hmm. So that their doubt could be relieved. So that they could know with assurance he is the living God. You and I don't have that benefit. And yet we do. That's what you and I do for each other. That is exactly what happens on communion. We are eating the body and blood, tasting and being part of, in communion with this God of creation. Every time we share in communion, we are reminded again of the God who is living, living in you and me. Maybe we do think it's kind of ironic that Jesus wanted to eat. <laughs> I mean, I do kind of laugh at that every time. Yeah, it's kind of like he just nonchalantly all of a sudden says, hey, what do you got to eat in the house? What do you got? I'm hungry. And they gave him fish. Well, I think in many of our homes, um, you know, I, I grew up in a very traditionally Swedish home that when it was FICA, 
time for FICA. We had our, we, uh, Grandma always had FICA for all of us. I learned as a very young child to drink coffee. Okay, it was out of the saucer because it had to cool down. And Grandma always had the pastry, the cardamom or the cinnamon rolls to go with it. I became that baker. I have become that person. I hope that when anyone stops at my home, I have something I can offer to that person. I don't know. Why did Jesus want to eat with them? The same reason we do it. Because it is over the table that we build relationships. See, it is over the communion table that we build relationships with each other. It is where we touch the lives of each other. The hardest part for me about having been isolated away from each of you for so long is that we have not been able to sit at the table and touch. We have not even shared communion at the same table. We have not been able to do those things that Jesus wanted them to do. And I think the touching is for you and me the same. There is a physicality connection. There's something energetic about that. When we touch and hug that person. I was just on Messenger the other night with a friend of mine. And his comment was, I miss you so much because of your hugs. Hugs. It is the touching, the physicality that we each as humans need. And I think that's what Jesus was helping us understand. Peace be with you is all of our senses and all the emotions. It is the sight and the smell and the touch. It is the wrapping of arms. Peace be with you, my brothers and sisters. We longingly await that time we can. But I think those are the words we need to echo in our prayers to our brothers and sisters around the world. We have brothers and sisters who are devastated in Minneapolis, in Washington, D.C., in New York, in L.A., in Paris, in Hong Kong. Around the world, there is grieving. And my friends, I think we do have to step back. And as, I did, as we have gone through, who are you looking for? What are you concerned about? What are you afraid of? Peace be given to all children of God. Peace to reign upon our nights and our days in the days ahead. Now I have to chuckle. After I got my peace tat done, there were some people who were a little surprised because I have to say, I've never been an advocate of tats. Just that way. Uh, what... The one who probably was the most surprised and most shocked was my son. Okay, Patrick is in the Air Force. Has tats. He has quite a few. He has a lot. And in fact, I think it was, well, it was, it was that Thanksgiving. We happened to be with the kids and um, I kind of kept my sleeves down for a little bit because I didn't want to shock like everyone really fast. But I, I showed my daughter-in-law and she just started screaming. She's like, that is so amazing. I didn't think you'd ever do it. And I said, but there's a reason. It's not just because I wanted something goofy. 
And I showed my son, and he's like, oh my gosh, I think the end of, end of time must be happening because I can't believe. And I said, Patrick, let me tell you my story. And he listened, and he's like, Mom, that is so cool. He said, I think God was talking to you. I think God was with you. I said, I know he was. I said, all he was doing was giving me assurance that what I was doing was good. But what he had planned for me was even greater. Greater. And I do believe that. Brothers and sisters, on this night, I do leave you with peace. I pray for peace in our world and I ask you to pray for peace in each of our communities, in each of our spaces, that there be calmness, that we start to understand God is present. He is alive and living within each of us. The disciples, questioning as they did, just wanted to touch, just wanted to be with God. Let's pray. God, on this night, let there be peace. Let there be calmness. Let us know how to serve others as you speak to each of us. God, we know you do speak to each of us. Sometimes with a very soft sound. Sometimes we hear it in Swedish. Sometimes they're very loudly through breaks. But God, you speak. So be with us this night. Let these your children and all children go to bed tonight peaceful. God, we ask now for peace to come upon all of our nations. We ask in your name. Amen. And now, my brothers and sisters, may the God who walks before us guide us. May the God who walks behind us hold us. May the God who walks next to us be with us. And the God who is above us be with you all. Peace be with you, my friends. See you Sunday and next Wednesday. Shalom.